Welcome to the Four Witnesses of the Messiah, Chapter 5, Session 4A, Jesus' Autumn and Winter Itinerary, Part 1. Because of our chronological approach to the Gospels, we are able to clearly see that Jesus' ministry was really moving. Now, even though the higher echelon of the Jews, the Sanhedrin, Pharisees, and Sadducees, rejected him, many of the rest of the believers were accepting him. Jesus had gained many new disciples when he had spoken so boldly at the Feast of Tabernacles and healed that blind man. Then his steamroller really began moving with the sending out of the Seventy, which I believe occurred soon after the Feast of Tabernacles. Like I said in the earlier session, it would be spiritually important to follow up on all the new converts gained at the Feast of Tabernacles. Consequently, I think that the 70 were sent out soon thereafter. They, indeed, would shake things up so much spiritually, the adversary himself had to come down and try to shore up his kingdom. Jesus probably went back into the safety of Galilee, teaching, ministering, and following up their efforts of the 70. But, ultimately, he would end up back in Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. Luke 10, 1 confirms that Jesus would follow them, the 70. He'd follow them up. So, I believe that in the nine-week period, between Tabernacles and Dedication records that activity. We're going to vividly see two diverse reactions to Jesus' efforts, the intransigence of the Pharisees and the approbation of the common believers. So, we arrive at the first event of this section, Event 5.14, The Lawyer's Question. Please turn to Luke, chapter 10, verse 25. Luke, chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, these lawyers were ones that were skilled in the law of Moses. And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said to him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Now that means live in the resurrection of the just. There's a similar event later with another lawyer. But the circumstances are different. Here, the lawyer supplies the answer, and the latter Jesus does. But this lawyer gave a solid answer. But remember, there was an ulterior motive for verse 25 has the word tempted. The Greek word for tempted is ek perazo. The word perazo without the ek prefix that the ek is an intensifier. Perazo means to test. And the trial or test can be in a good sense or tempt in a bad sense. But with the prefix, ek prefix, all of the occurrences of that in the New Testament are in a bad sense. So, I think the lawyer was trying to trick him. I think the lawyer had something up his sleeve. Verse 29, but he, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Aha! There's the trick. And so he had a setup in his mind. What, Whatever Jesus was going to answer what the neighbor was, then the lawyer was prepared to counter it. But Jesus was very wise, and he answered with an example. Verse 30, And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. 
And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and he passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. So, Jesus said, Which now of these three do you think was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So, that was so skillful of an answer. But you know what? I don't think that it was just some story. I think it really happened and was known because Jesus did not call it a parable. Jesus gave him an answer that the lawyer couldn't entrap him with. (laughs) If the disrespected low-class Samaritan was accounted as a neighbor, then that had to include everybody else. The lawyer couldn't wiggle out of that in any way to turn it against Jesus. (laughs) Next event, next event is event 5.15. Mary and Martha, Luke ten thirty eight ten thirty eight. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now, this incident is the closest one in this section of Luke that might give us an exact location of where one of the 35 missionary teams was sent because Jesus went to follow up and he was there in town during this period. It actually might have been on the way home from the feast. There are some manuscripts that omit the word her, invited into her home. Her in verse 38. Papyrus number 4 and papyrus number 75. Codex Vaticanus omit it. Codex Alexandrinus and the first corrector of Codex Sinaiticus have it. We know from John 11.1 1, that Martha's house was in Bethany, a suburb of Jerusalem. So, if the word her is retained in the text, then one of Jesus' first stops in following up on the 70 would have been in Bethany. If it's omitted, it still could have been her house, or it could have been somebody else's house in some other city. There was a crew of women who accompanied Jesus' entourage, and Mary and Martha could have been on that crew from time to time. John 11 says that Jesus loved them, Mary and Martha, so that implies they had a relationship. So they could have been on his crew. But the use of the words received them into the house implies to me that it was still Martha's house, which would have been in Bethany. Now, the scribes who may have added the word her were responding to strengthen that implication. So, there are several Marys in the New Testament. Of course, Jesus' mother, and also Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James the Less and Joseph, Zebedee's children, is also called the other Mary. Then there is Mary, the wife of Cleophas. Mary, the mother of John and Mark the writer of the Gospel of Mark. And finally, we know Mary, the sister of Martha. So it could go either way where this was, but I actually prefer Bethany because it fits with the logic that Jesus was following up on the 70, and the inclusion of this incident in the chronology would illustrate that. 
it's the chronological context of why it says it, where it says it, when it says it. But the modern practical application of this passage, I think, is sometimes during big events, there are some believers, especially those who have important skills, that are assigned to work, 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 work. And those guys don't get much time to listen in on the teachings and be rewarded to see the fruit of their labor. Well, in my opinion, work at big events like that should be scheduled or split between shifts so that those special folks can have the blessing of partaking in some of the teaching and events. I think Jesus would agree. Next event, next event, 5.16. I call this a reprise of the Sermon on the Mount foundational teachings. Reprise of the Sermon on the Mount foundational teachings. This next incident involves the reteaching of parts of the Sermon on the Mount. Well, it stands to reason that this would be necessary if there were a bunch of new believers who had just come over to him at the Feast of Tabernacles. This was his foundational class. Luke 11.1, Luke 11.1. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, When he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Well, this is a reprise of Matthew 6, 9 and following. Well, Jesus taught him his way, not John's. I spent 150 pages on the universe of prayer in my volume 2 book on the Sermon on the Mount, Canonizing a Counterculture, as well as a bit of time in chapter 4 of this class. The Lord's Prayer is so deep. I found at least seven levels of understanding in it, which vividly illustrate the genius of Jesus. I'm not going to teach it all over again. You can go back to that session or the book to get all that. But there are millions of Christians who recite the Lord's Prayer mechanically. Boy, if they only knew they were speaking gold. Wow. So, understanding how to pray is part of Jesus' foundational teaching. Luke eleven two, And he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that's indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's where the prayer ends. The additional words in Matthew, for thine is the kingdom and the power and glory. Those were added to the text. Now Jesus moves on to reteach other elements of his foundational teaching. Luke 11, 5. Luke. 11.5 And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give that to you. Now, Pillai explains that it was the role of the grandparents to teach the children. The entire family clan, several generations, lived in the same set of buildings, the family compound. The kids would even sleep with their grandparents till they'd grown up. And the grandparents' responsibility would be to teach them about God every evening. It was a sacred custom which should not be interrupted. So that's why he said, I can't get up. The children are with me. Luke 11.8. Luke 11.8. I say unto you that though he will not rise and give him, he doesn't want to get up. Because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity. The word importunity in King James is insistence, persistence. 
So because of his persistence, he's just going to keep bugging him. He will rise and give him as many as he needs. Now that makes sense. But now, look at what it is applied to. Verse 9, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Those are all in the present tense, continuous. So, the example earlier about asking the friend that didn't want to get up, and then finally he got up because his other friend was bugging him, Well, the practical application is keep bugging God if you don't get it. (laughs) Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a reteaching of Matthew 7, 7. Foundational. For verse 10, for everyone that asks receives and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. So, how to receive from God? Foundational material. The practical application of this, you know, many Christians feel uncomfortable in continuing to supplicate God for things if they don't immediately receive answers to prayer. You know, yeah, we often soon get answers if we know how to pray. But sometimes there's unseen complicating factors. So what do you do? Quit? Try to rationalize some reason that actually contradicts the Bible. Why we shouldn't receive it? Heavens, no. Jesus said, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. They're in the present tense. Continuous action. And I concur. I say keep asking, seeking, and knocking until you knock the door down. Luke 11, 11. Luke 11, 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Heck no. That was taught in Matthew seven eleven, Verse 13, application. If you then, being evil, carnal, know how to give good gifts to your children, oh, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? See, there's a common stumbling block to prayer, which actually has its roots in the accusatory climate of Phariseeism and all that judgmentalness. And so Jesus had to deal with it. He was addressing the basics that new folks needed to learn. But at the same time, he also was furthering the education of the twelve apostles. So this is what this next incident does. Event 5.17 Event 5.17 Further information on the adversary's kingdom. Luke 11.14 Luke 11.14 And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was out. The dumb spoke, and the people wondered. But some of them said, I cast out devils through Beelz above the chief of devils. See, here we literally see the two reactions that Jesus was receiving during this nine-week period, the autumn and winter itinerary. The people wondered. What Jesus did was spectacular. They had never seen anything like it. But the Pharisees had to try something to quash it, to deprecate such an obvious miracle. So they resorted to the accusation they had cooked up earlier. They said Jesus was using Beelzebub, a bigger devil, to cast out littler devils. And they also attempted a distraction that they had tried earlier, too to tempt Jesus asking for a sign. Well, that was typical unbelieving scripted Pharisee behavior. Luke 11:16. Luke 11:16. And others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven, but he knowing their thoughts said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. 
If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, then by whom do your sons cast them out? Woo! Therefore they shall be your judges. Their sons were their followers. The Pharisees' followers. It's obvious that Jesus and the Pharisees were on opposing sides. So, if Jesus was right, what does that make the Pharisees? Who? Whoa, Nelly. So, Luke eleven twenty. Luke eleven twenty. Jesus said, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. The finger of God here is Holy Spirit. The finger of God is not someone trying to play God and bring about sea change through violence or murder. Jesus now revealed more information about the adversary's kingdom. Once we understand this, we can put together an event which I passed over explaining earlier. Luke 11.21 Luke 11.21 When a strong man armed keeps his palace his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, and he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted, and divides his spoils. There are two scenarios that this is true. The stronger kicks out the weaker. Number one scenario. If the strong man is a higher ranking spirit in Satan's hierarchy... Number two, if the strong man is a believer who's kicking out the spirit. Look at Luke 11.23. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. See, two scenarios, A, B, A, B. So there's negative and positive of verse 21 and 22. The strong man could be a believer. Strong man could be the adversary. Then, Luke eleven twenty four. Look at this. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and finding none, he says, I will return unto my house whence I came out. See, Jesus is disclosing secrets of the dark realm. Those Pharisees should never have provoked him, saying, hey, he's kicking them out with Beelzebub, because now Jesus is disclosing this information. The adversary wanted secret, because those spirits don't like being in a disembodied state. I'm now going to return to a prior event, event 4.34, the deliverance of the man with legion that I skipped over because I intended to return to it later to cover some more details. So go to Luke, Luke 8, 26. Luke 8, 26. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to the land, there met him out of the city, a certain man who had daimonion, devils, a long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. And they knew Jesus was more powerful than they were, for he was commanding, is the tense of the verb, the unclean spirit to come out of him. For oftentimes it had caught him and he was he kept bound with chains and in fetters. And he broke the bands and was driven of the devil. And this is Dimon into the wilderness. Verse 30. And Jesus asked him, saying, What's your name? And he said, Legion. Because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. Oh, more information. The Greek word deep is abusos, the abyss. To them, it's like free falling in a bottomless pit. 
that's the spiritual dimension, the abyss, when they're kicked out and they have no contact in our realm. In Luke 11.24, the same thing is described as dry places, seeking rest and finding none. In Luke 8.28, the devils themselves described it as torment. They don't like it there. It's not restful because they want to parasitically get something out of possessing their hosts. When we cast out spirits, that's the state into which they go, disembodied, unconnected, in the abyss. But Jesus revealed the other possibility of bigger devils forcing out smaller ones, which happens in witchcraft. Walter Cummins, in his book, Acceptable Year of the Lord, explained this because of the use of the two words in this incident for devil spirits, daimon, the higher rank, and daimonion. It has the e iota in the end of it. That's the iota diminutive. So they're lower ranking ones. And by the way, I do believe devil spirits exist. Jesus said it, so I believe it. I don't pick and choose which statements of Jesus I'll accept or not. (laughs) When it comes to the Bible, I'm all in. (laughs) So, in Luke 8.29, Jesus was in the process of commanding the greater ranking daimon to leave the man. Luke 8.32, And there was a herd of many swine feeding in the mountain, and they besought him. Him who we're going to see that he would permit them to enter into them. And he permitted them. Well, we're going to see who. Verse 33, Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a deep place into the lake and were choked. And when they fed them, saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city, in the country, and they came back and told Jesus, Get out of here! We don't want you! So, some critics want to pin the blame on Jesus for the destruction of the swine. They're always looking for something to negative. However, there's a disagreement amongst the critical text for several readings in all three Gospels which describe this incident which may tell a different story. The Greek geeks that spent all their time in the books choosing their readings mainly based on external evidence they only know part of the story. Because it takes those who have actually contended with devil spirits to understand the spiritual realities. And that will sway which readings to choose. Because it reflects what really goes on in the spiritual realm. So, Mark 5, 6. Mark 5, 6. Here's another account of it. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Ooh, yeah. Devil spirits, they can worship. Look really good. Verse 7, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God, you don't torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of him, you unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. No. The word country there is kora, which means place or space or spot in which one is. They like it in this realm. They don't like it in the deep. Huh. Verse 11. Now there was nigh into the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Verse 13. And forth with Jesus. And the words forth with and Jesus is not in many texts. In many texts, it's he. He who. He gave them leave, permitted. And the unclean spirits went out, entered in the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea. About 2,000 of them. And were choked into the sea. See, Jesus was sending them into that other place that they didn't want to go. The abyss. The disembodied state. He didn't send them into the swine. He just said, get out! 
It was the daimon, he, that gave the daimonion permission. They thought by that means they could sully Jesus' arrival in that country. They thought they succeeded. But remember what Jesus did? He planted that seed that grew. He told the man to publicize his deliverance. And so when Jesus came back a month or so later, he was welcomed and did miracles among them. Wow. Matthew eight twenty eight through 32 is the same passage. So back in Luke. Jesus discloses more about the dark realm. They should have never done it. They should have never provoked Jesus because now he's letting know stuff that the adversary wanted secret. Luke eleven twenty five. So when this spirit says, I think I'm going to check out my old place because I don't like it here in this disembodied state. And so when he comes, he finds it swept in garnished. Then goes he and takes to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And we've seen this. If you deliver someone, and then they rationalize that evil again, and get back into the same stuff, it's going to be deeper, and they'll even be more blind. Wow. Well, Well, how do you keep them out if they want to come back? Well, how do they get in? We know that's by sin that developed into iniquity. Well, that's all starts to the mind, and it leads to actions. Therefore, one must chain one's mind to keep them out. Stop thinking and acting on the evil that let them in. We can minister to someone and believe you kick them out. We, you, we can kick them out left and right if you want. But you don't kick them out unless you teach the people what to do. Minister to them and take care of them. I taught about all that in my white paper on God's awesome power over the spiritual realm. Because when we command it, those devil spirits get zapped spiritually and they got to go. But what keeps them out? the continued believing and renewed mind of the victim. But there's another way that they can get evicted, and that's what happened with Legion and the herd of swine. The dive owner was responsible for that. But now the devil's in real trouble in this account in Luke, because you know what? Every time Satan tried one of his tricks, Jesus punched back hard, and it cost the adversary, because now... Jesus' disciples are going to know even more about the adversary's secrets. Oh, no! So he had to distract them from that somehow to confuse and to redirect. So that's what happened in Luke eleven twenty seven. It came to pass, as he spoke these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Jesus put it right back on subject. This is how you keep them out. This woman was working for Satan and trying to confuse things. But Jesus wouldn't have it. This statement actually is the figment of pagan religion, which later developed into the adoration of Mary by the Roman Catholic Church. Jesus corrected her sternly. The yea, rather, in that verse 28, is not a strong enough translation of the Greek men un ge, which Thayer translates as surely not. He says it's used to correct something previously said. So, Jesus actually came down on that like a ton of bricks. So, even more contential confusion was stirred up again by the adversary by surging the crowd. You're going to see it. Well... The adversary better watch out because Jesus is going to counterpunch and it's going to cost him. Luke eleven twenty nine, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign and there shall be no sign given to it, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was the sign to the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. And the queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the uttermost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, how greater than Solomon is here. 
and the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold uh, greater than Jonah is here verse 33 no man when he has lit a candle puts it in a secret place we have the light and we're going to use it neither under a bushel but on a candlestick we're going to shine the light and the adversary can't have it I don't care, because it's going to defeat him. They that which come may see the light. See, this is foundational. If you have light, don't sit on it. Use it. The light of the body. Now, here is something. Wow. The light of the body is the spiritual understanding. Therefore, when your eye, your spiritual understanding is single, haploos, simple, no ulterior motive... Your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye, your spiritual thinking is evil, your whole body is full of darkness. In this context, how is this being applied? Ooh. Verse 35. Take heed therefore that that light, quote unquote, that you think is light, which is in you is not actually darkness. Well, that exactly fits the description of somebody who's possessed. They don't realize it. Wow. If your whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole will be full of light as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. This teaching about one's eye being single is a continuation of the subject regarding keeping the satanic spirits out. It's a different application from the original teaching in Matthew 6, but it's true nonetheless. If one's spiritual outlook, if one's thinking is pure, one will have no darkness in them. No devil spirits. Wow. Context by dear Watson. Context. So, now the disciples understood this whole subject in light of the word. Wow! <laughs> Next event. Event 5.18. Event 5.18. Woes to the Pharisees and lawyers. Now we'll see the other reaction. The unbelief of the Pharisees. Luke 11.37 And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. Well, that was a generous offer. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had first not washed his hands before dinner. Wow! And things quickly turned south after that. Verse 39. And the Lord said to him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. You fools! Did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees! You tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Woe unto you, Pharisees! For you love the uttermost seats in the synagogues and greeting in the markets. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like graves which appear not, and men walk over them and are not aware of it. Woo! See, the law said that if anyone touched something associated with death, they'd be ceremonially unclean and be forbidden from certain activities for a period of time. And then they'd have to wash and cleanse themselves. So Jesus compared Pharisees to unmarked graves that make people unclean without them knowing it. <laughs> Whoa, Nellie. Luke 11.45. Luke 11.45. Then answered one of the lawyers and said to him, Master, thus saying thou reproachest us also. 
Big mistake. All right. You want some of this too? (laughs) So Jesus gave him some. Verse 46. And he said, Woe unto you also, you lawyers, for you laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and you yourselves touched not the burdens with one of your fingers. Typical Pharisee behavior. Woe unto you, for you build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Huh. That hypocrisy is like provoking a fight and then decrying violence. Ooh. Verse 48. Truly you bear witness, you allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their sepulchres. Wherefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which is shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple in the court of the priests. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Wow. Woe unto you, lawyers, for you have taken away the keys, in Aramaic it's plural, the keys of knowledge. You enter not in yourselves, and them that were entering you hindered. Wow, what an indictment. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying in wait for him, seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Boy, (laughs) that party degenerated quick into a mess, but... You know, if there's poison, you got to warn people about it. Event 5.19. Event 5.19. Continued reprise of the Sermon on the Mount teachings. We go to Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, See, it's growing and growing, insomuch that they trod on one another. He began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Jesus taught that earlier in Matthew 16. It's foundational. Do you see the development of this subject? It's literal right here. The leaven of the Pharisees. Wow. This is one of the two reactions to his ministry vividly illustrated in this section. Verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. That will happen in the judgments. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that have no more they can do. See, this is Matthew 10 stuff regarding Satan's seed. Foundational material. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. It's talking about not making it into the resurrection of the just. Luke 12, 6. Luke 12, 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? So this is a reteaching of Matthew six twenty six. Are you not much better than they? Verse 7. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore... You are of more value than many sparrows. God is for you, not against you. The other, the opposite, is Pharisaic teaching. Verse 8, And I say to you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. That's the reiteration of Matthew 10, 32, and Luke 12, 8. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God at the judgments. Wow. This is a new way to eternal life. It's through the Son of God. Jesus was building that bridge to salvation. It was only about six months 
left to Passover, counting the second eight-hour month. And about seven weeks after that, when the winds of change would bring in a new and greater kind of salvation, Christ in you, Jesus had to get the word out in preparation for that change. Luke 12.10. Luke 12.10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven So, Jesus covered this in Mark 3 and Luke 12. So, the teaching about the two seeds is foundational material. He's teaching these new folks that had just come to his ministry, that he's following up after the 70. Luke 12, verse 11, And when they bring you into the synagogues and under the magistrates and powers, take no thought how or what thing you shall answer, or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you should ought to say. Wow. So the crowds now were huge. Luke twelve says an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch they trod upon one another. See, since he was not in Galilee, he didn't have the Sea of Galilee to use as an aid of crowd control like he had. This would have been an audience with new believers in it. The ones to whom he had declared a few weeks earlier, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So, each of these small paragraphs that I'm sharing with you about his foundational material that he was teaching were probably summaries They probably were entire teachings, okay, at many locations throughout, because it doesn't say where the locations were. It just gives the sum and substance of the teaching. Luke 12, 13, Luke 12, 13. And one of the companies said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? (laughs) And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. You see, some people think that the abundant life, quote unquote, is characterized by material abundance. Oh, often that causes more problems than it helps. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 declares that godliness is not gained. As I mentioned in an earlier session, our abundance is spiritual. And it lasts long after this life because it's the kind of riches that one can take with them into the hereafter. Remember the seven kinds of abundance in 2 Corinthians? So now we get to Luke twelve sixteen, And a parable he spoke to them, saying... The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought with himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow all my fruit. And he said to them, This will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Saul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he that layeth up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. So that's the point. See, this is a parable. And remember, parables are supposed to only have one point. Every analogy breaks down. They're not meant for you to go willy-nilly with everything in them and try to find applications. There is one application. And sometimes it's obvious. Other times it tells you what it is, which is exactly what verse 21 does. Verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore, I say to you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat neither for the body what you shall put on the life is more than meat and the body is more than clothing consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap which neither have storehouse nor barn 
and God feeds them, how much more are you, are you better than the foul walls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? And if you then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take you thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you, that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass which today is in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more shall he clothe you, O you of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, that's, of course, from Matthew 6 and the Sermon on the Mount. See, Jesus was back to reteaching a lot of his foundational material because these were new people. And that paragraph we just read was on the renewed mind. Luke twelve thirty two. Fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, it was God's good pleasure for them in that administration to do that, just like he does the same in our administration in Ephesians 1. He digs it. Chapter 12, verse 33. Sell what you have, give alms, provide yourselves bags which grow not old, a treasure in the heavens that fails not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. Foundational teaching, law of giving. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. From Matthew 6. So, I think it's easy to see Jesus' two-tiered message in this autumn and winter missionary follow-up itinerary. It was dictated by the needs of his audience. They were teachings to the new converts who needed to be taught Jesus' foundational material. That is why I teach that the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus' lesson plan for his ministry. He taught it throughout his ministry. It was his foundational class. We shall continue into the second half of this nine-week period between the Feast of Tabernacles and Dedication after the break. Bless you.